Well, good morning, New North. My name is McKenna, and I'm community life pastor here. We are in week two of a new sermon series called One Kingdom Indivisible. And the beauty of this series is that we're actually doing this in partnership with a bunch of churches in the Bay Area, going all the way from the North Bay all the way down to the Santa Cruz area. And our hope is that in this series, we all get a chance to explore together what life can look like when God is in charge. And before we jump in today, I'm just gonna pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just give you this morning and we invite you into it, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to lay down our biases, lay down the things inside of us that keep us from understanding you and your word, God. And I pray, Lord, that instead your, your spirit would fill us and remind us of all of the good you have for us, God. We thank you for your provision for us, and we ask for you to just be here. In your precious name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but the past few months, I have felt a little bit like my life is moving through molasses. Every moment, every decision feels a little bit harder than normal, feels a little bit more labored. In the last three weeks in particular, since the murder of George Floyd, there has been this inescapable heaviness in the air. We seem divided, we feel isolated, we're confused. A lot of us are angry. I feel this tremendous weight on me. And internally, I just keep asking myself this question and just saying over and over, this is not the way it's supposed to be. How do I fix it? And honestly, even though I've felt this way at other points in my life, most of the time I can do things to momentarily hang up the weight around my neck and take a deep breath. But right now in this moment in history, it doesn't actually seem possible. I mean, even our commercials are sad. Have you noticed that? I watched a Frito-Lay commercial last night that made me cry. What on earth does a chip commercial have, why on earth is a chip commercial making me cry? We desperately need good news, but not just the kind of good news that we get excited for for a moment. We need the type of good news that grows hope in us that we can grab onto and know with certainty and bank our futures on. But you know who else felt that way? Jews in the first century. You see, thousands of them had been killed in order to keep Rome's version of the peace, I mean, Rome was tolerant of religion, particularly Jewish religion, as long as it didn't rock the boat because dissent in all forms were crushed. And when Jews in Judea revolted in 4 BC, General Varus, a decorated Roman official, actually crucified 2,000 of them all at once. I wonder if Jews in the first century felt the same kind of weight that we feel today. I mean, it's no wonder that the Jewish nation anxiously awaited the promised Messiah. Now, John the Baptist, who was anointed by God to pave the way for Jesus, preached a very simple message to Jews experiencing this kind of atmosphere. He preached, repent or turn around from your ways because the kingdom of God is near. Thousands flocked to John in the wilderness, hoping that what he preached actually was the fulfillment of all that they hoped for. And he baptized the masses that that came to him in the Jordan River. In fact, John actually baptized Jesus himself. But when John was arrested and put in prison, Jesus took up that same message. The pathway had been paved for him. What the Jews had been awaiting actually was happening. In Mark chapter one, verse 14 and 15, We read, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God had come near and that was the good news and the simple message that Jesus preached. Now the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably in the New Testament. And together they appear 162 times, which means God really wanted us to understand this concept. Now, while the terms themselves are used very rarely in the Old Testament, God being king of his kingdom was central to a Jewish understanding of the world. 
God's kingdom coming would not have been a new idea by any stretch of the imagination to Jews listening to this message at the time. And it was an exciting message to be sure. Now, Jews had all kinds of ideas about what this coming Messiah of this coming kingdom was gonna be like. I mean, the kingdom of God that they expected would have come to overthrow Roman occupation. Now, what kind of a king sets up a kingdom without actual land? The Messiah that was gonna come because of that was probably gonna be a militaristic and he probably would have at least appeared strong. I mean, our natural inclination as humans is to gain and exert power. So why wouldn't the way God operated his kingdom, why wouldn't it look like that? But Jesus coming and the way that he brought his kingdom was so different than anyone expected. And yet it was the best news for Jews in the first century. And I think that the same message is actually the good news we need here today. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. We're talking about how the kingdom of God coming is the good news we need right now. And we're talking about how that impacts the way that we live. So why is the coming kingdom of God the good news we need to remember right now? First, because our citizenship is now in heaven. About a month ago, which actually feels more like 17 years ago, if I'm truthful, we finished up a series on the letter the apostle Paul wrote to a city, a church in a city called Philippi. The, Philipp, it was, the letter is called Philippians. And in Philippians chapter three, verse 20 and 21, Paul says this, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, if you remember, Philippi was actually conquered by Augustus Caesar, which is why it was under Roman rule. And when the Roman army had taken it under its control, they ended up dishing out the land to Roman soldiers so that they could live there. Philippi, in essence was made up of a bunch of Roman veterans who are very proud of their Roman citizenship. So when Paul is talking to the Philippians and saying their, their citizenship, which by the way is very political language, saying their citizenship is primarily in heaven, he's saying their loyalties and affections lie first and foremost with the kingdom of God over their, their uh, identity as Romans. The same is absolutely true with us. As followers of Jesus, the loyalties that dictate our decisions and our lifestyles are first determined by our devotion to Jesus. Everything else is filtered through that first allegiance to Christ. And like the Romans were called to Romanize whatever province they happen to be living in, we similarly are called to heavenize wherever we are also. Now to us, who are 2000 years and thousands of miles removed from the message Paul preached to the Philippians or the message Paul wrote to the Philippians, of course, the newness of being a follower of Jesus for Roman citizen would have come with new prioritization. It seems obvious, especially all the things we know about the way that Rome treated people. Of course, there would have to be a flushing of an old way of thinking. But what about for us today in America? Does it seem quite as obvious? I think most of us agree with Paul's sentiments in theory, but we also have a really hard time recognizing how the institutions around us, especially the ones that we love and the ones that we affiliate ourselves with, rub against our identities as followers of Jesus. But the risk as a follower of Jesus is much too high for us to stay comfortable with our blind spots because the risk is that we stop heavenizing the place where, we, where we're living and we settle for less than God's best for us. It is mind boggling to me that some of my most passionate beliefs, the ones that I hold the most tightly are not actually beliefs that are informed by my faith in Jesus, but instead informed by the political party or organization or politician that I've either decided I love or I've decided that I hate. I have so many times found myself looking at a policy or a political view, and instead of first looking at it through the lens of my understanding and my desire for the kingdom of God to come, I look at it through the lens of biases I've already created in my head. There's this theory with a lot of data behind it called confirmation bias, 
which is our tendency to agree with the things that already affirm what we believe and disagree with things that we already do not. So in short, in short research shows that we believe what we want to believe and it takes a lot to change our minds. Now, knowing this about ourselves would be very disheartening if we didn't know Jesus. Because you see, this actually points to the fact that our political parties, our ideologies, our policies, even cultural movements are not our hope. Can they change things? Of course they can. Politics and politicians and, and government governments and organizations and systems can change things for good, which is why we should absolutely care about them. Christians should be actively engaged in politics but we don't engage because we love a political party. We engage because we love Jesus. We are a part of his kingdom, which informs our care for the world he created and is in the process of making new again. That's why we engage. Eugene Cho in his book, Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. He says, we must be flexible in our political leanings, but inflexible in the way Jesus taught us to live and love. Now, the reason that this is such good news that we're citizens of this new kingdom is that we can live unabashedly by the principles and lifestyle we see presented to us by God, knowing that at the end of all things, he is the victor. He's the one who wins. Our hope is found in a different kingdom and we can engage even patriotically in the country we live. And for most of us watching today, that's the United States of America, knowing that however amazing the principles our country aspires to are, or however terrible the actions we perpetuate, the US is not the source of our satisfaction, our ultimate safety, nor is it a guarantee for our future. Jesus is, and we are banking all of our hope on him and his coming kingdom. The ever-changing shaky ground that we are on as a nation and as a world is actually not the ground that we're standing on. We stand on the ground of another kingdom and the king of this kingdom doesn't change, he doesn't fail, he doesn't forget about us and he calls us to love others with abandon. Now, Paul knew that this was the good news the Romans needed in order to recognize that their lives, had, their, their lives needed to have their feet in the right kingdom. And I think that that's the reason why it's such good news for us. We need to remember what ground we're standing on. We need to remember we are not primarily American, though we can be patriotic. We are not primarily Democrats or Republicans, though voting and having opinions is important. We are primarily followers of Jesus. Our allegiance to the kingdom of God comes before any institution, and that is the best news because our citizenship is in heaven. Second, why is the kingdom of heaven the good news we need right now? Well, because we are included even though we don't deserve it. It's interesting that when Jesus interacted with the religious leaders of his day, they often commented on his lack of morality. He was seen even more than just a rule breaker, but as a sinner and as a blasphemer. And primarily it was because of the company that, that he kept and the times that he chose to keep it. He had this ragtag tag group of disciples, not the trained kind other rabbis had following them around. And the kingdom language that Jesus uses throughout his whole ministry was actually very political, which rubbed people the wrong way. I mean, it was after all a kingdom of God, not a community of God or a family of God that Jesus preached, which would have been a lot more palatable for everyone involved. And that just didn't fit the Jewish idea of what was supposed to be. Now, Jesus kept company with people the religious leaders were not comfortable including. And because of the people he run, run, hung out with, the sinners, the tax collectors, prostitutes, those kicked to the outskirts of society because of their disabilities, Jesus seemed like he was soft on sin. Now, one of the most profound views into the kingdom of God that we get in the whole New Testament, it's probably my favorite piece of scripture, is, is it reveals to us that Jesus is anything but soft on sin. And that is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five through seven. He actually raises the bar to a height that no one can reach. 
Now, Jesus in this sermon takes the bar of morality from not committing adultery to not lusting after another human, from not breaking an oath to not making an oath in the first place and instead just keeping your word. And then he says, he takes the bar from loving your neighbor to loving your neighbor and also loving your enemy. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Behavior acceptable in the kingdom of God wasn't softer than the Jews had expected. Jesus was actually much more serious about sin than any of us are. And in his seriousness, he raised the bar so high that he made it impossible for us to reach it without him. Jesus was aware of the radical nature of God's love and he leveled the playing field so absolutely no one could assume that they were the ones that had found their way into the kingdom of God without him. Now to those who were first listening to the Sermon on the Mount, this actually didn't seem like good news at all. It seemed exclusive, it seemed impossible. After all, Jesus had just told them to be perfect as their father in heaven was perfect. And for the people who had spent their entire lives attempting to perfectly keep the law, banking on their merit wasn't gonna cut it anymore. Maybe they hadn't committed adultery, but lust, uh, maybe they hadn't murdered somebody, but yeah, they probably hated someone before. Maybe they hadn't taken revenge, but I mean, who could blame them for defending themselves against somebody who was clearly evil? Though initially we find ourselves condemned by Jesus' message, the good news about the high morality of his kingdom is that we were never included because we did it on our own or deserved it in the first place. Our inclusion has always been and will always be because of God's love for us first, exhibited on the cross when he died because of our inability to live his way. He is the reason that we are included. Now, this is such good news, not just because we realize we're included, but because we also realize the playing field has been leveled. And I'm convinced that the more we internalize how we don't deserve the love that God's given us and how much love he's given us anyways, the more freely we can love people we might have, other, we might have otherwise considered the other. Now, because of our radical inclusion in a kingdom we don't belong him, we have the distinct and beautiful privilege and ability to do two very important things. First, we have the privilege as people of the kingdom of God to love our opponents. Now this past week on Facebook, there were at least three times when I had a perfectly articulated response to someone's post typed out and ready to send into the stratosphere when I stopped and had to check my motives. Each of those times, I ended up deleting what I was about to say because my response was laced with pride. As right as I thought I was, and as wrong as I thought the person I was responding to was, my heart was perched on my self-righteousness and I could feel my disdain for the other person growing as I was typing. Anyone ever felt like that? like you have this overwhelming desire through the safety of your computer screen to just pummel someone with what you wanna say? Well, Jesus, in calling us to love our enemies, is prohibiting us from ever dehumanizing anyone with our words, our actions, or even in our thoughts, no matter how much we disagree with them. In our self-righteousness, we can become exactly the thing we hate in others. And Jesus, in leveling the, fail, the playing field forces us to reckon with the reality, we're a lot more like the people we think are our enemies than we care to admit. There is no such thing as the other in the kingdom of God. Remember, the playing field's leveled. And that while that feels initially like Jesus is giving us some kind of restriction, that is actually Jesus imparting us with tremendous freedom. 
Why? Because suddenly we don't have to carry the burden of changing people, nor do we have to carry the fire of hatred that can char up the heart of even the strongest people of faith. God is the one who changes people. He changed us by loving us and we get to love people unabashedly. And second, not only do we get to love our opponents, we also get to love the people our politics impact. I'm reading a book right now by this man named Josh Butler, and he explained how he was living in a rural village in Cambodia where many of the children in this village were actually sold to traffickers under the guise of having a new life. And when Butler was talking to a pastor in the local, in the local village about what he was doing about it, the pastor responded to him and basically said, you know, that he agreed that kids being sold in trafficking was a tragedy. Um, but he said he was focused on saving souls and holiness so that people could go to heaven. There is something dramatically wrong with that picture. And yet I think if we're truly deeply honest with ourselves, we accidentally fall into the same trap sometimes, thinking injustice is a tragedy out there and failing to realize that we are the ones called to mend it and to make it right again. I mean, we live in a physical reality where our decisions directly and indirectly impact people. And while God does care about our salvation and he does care about our holiness, he also cares about justice because he cares infinitely about people. He cares about people on the margins, immigrants, refugees, those suffering from mental illness. He cares about people who have had voices that go unheard, the unborn, women who find themselves in unexpected pregnancies, the elderly, victims of trafficking, our brothers and sisters who are people of color. He cares about people Christians tend to think couldn't fit into a Christian mold, the LGBTQ community, Muslims, people who are incarcerated. God cares about people and we get to love people. In Matthew 25, Jesus explains this picture of what it's gonna be like when we're finally standing before him. And he says, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Because of the good news of the kingdom of God, we have the freedom to love people who are the least of these because every single human was created and imparted with the image of God whose kingdom we are standing in. We get to care about people without reservation and that is good news. Josh Butler in his response to his experience in Cambodia with the salvation centered pastor and probably really good intention pastor said, Jesus calls us to holiness and justice. Holiness involves dealing with the spark, the poisoned well, the root in our own hearts. Justice involves dealing with the wildfires, the raging rivers, the wicked trees in our world. Holiness and justice are the tools Jesus has given us as the means by which the church proclaims its resurrected King and bears witness to his kingdom that is coming soon to reconcile heaven and earth and redeem the world. We have to be a people who care about justice and thus we need to be engaged in the world we're living in. We don't care about justice instead of holiness, but because of it. We have the privilege of sacrificing for the people our world wants to silence and disregard because we know their father and he is crazy about them. We have been included even though we don't deserve it. And that is the good news we need to sink our teeth into right now. Third, 
Why is the kingdom of heaven the good news we need right now? Because there is hope. Now, when the last two presidents were elected, both Barack Obama in 2008 for his first term and Donald Trump during the 2016 election, I was in two very different phases of my life, surrounded by two very different people groups. Uh, And during both of those elections, though, when the president-elect was announced, the people I was surrounded by cried. And as I talked to people working through their grief, both times I was struck by the thing that they were experiencing. And it was despair. Now, I don't say this to alienate people who voted in either way of either of the elections, but to make the point that it is possible to despair the state of our world and the state of our politics, no matter which way you lean. But as followers of Jesus, who live in anticipation of another kingdom coming in its fullness, the good news is that we don't need to despair. Now, this doesn't excuse us to, this doesn't give us permission to excuse ourselves from politics or from enacting justice. In fact, it does exactly the opposite. We get to engage because we want the kingdom of heaven to come in its fullness now. And knowing our king keeps us from despairing when the things around us don't look the way that they should. Our foundation as a follower of Jesus will not move no matter who is elected, how our society changes, and what our government looks like. We ultimately serve a king of compassion, a king of justice, a king of holiness, who will always have the last word. Things are done differently in the kingdom of God, and that is the best news. We don't have to despair because our hope is in the end of the story our king has promised us, a day when there's going to be no more pain, no more tears, no more injustice, and we will live fully inside the perfection of his kingdom. We are kingdom people first, and that is the good news that we can rest in today. Even John the Baptist, the one who had set the stage for Jesus' ministry, ended up having his doubts about this kingdom that was coming. And all of it stemmed from the news that he was hearing while he was in prison. I mean, perhaps the news just seemed a little bit too small or not dramatic enough. Perhaps the kingdom that Jesus was making wasn't quite creating the splash John was expecting it to. Maybe he thought that this new kingdom would be ushered in in a way where he actually wouldn't have to face death because of his role in it, because John's imprisonment actually did end up in his beheading. But anyways, John had got to a point where he was a little bit confused about what was going on. And he sent his disciples to ask Jesus this one haunting question. John's disciples approach Jesus and they ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Can you imagine what John must have been feeling? Something like, did my life amount to anything? Was I just confused? Did I, did I bank everything on the wrong person? I mean, things don't seem to be the way that they should, Jesus. Are you really the one who is to come or was I actually expecting somebody different? Now in his mercy, Jesus doesn't condemn John. He tells John's disciples, go. Back, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The kingdom of God was breaking in and the king what was, was taking what was wrong in the world and setting it back to right again. So this morning, If you are bogged down with a question that's similar to my question, what is going on? Or similar to John's, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Take heart. The king of our kingdom is on the move. He's coming. He will set the world right again and he has invited us to participate with him as he binds up our wounds, heals our afflictions, dries our eyes and unites people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We are kingdom people, and that is the best of news. Let's pray. 
Oh, Father, we just thank you so much that we are living in anticipation and in, and in the present of your kingdom being here, God. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to live in this, your kingdom now. God, I pray that you would allow us to know the, the ground that our feet stand on so well that we can invite others to stand on it with us, God. I pray, Lord, that we would be people of love and of mercy and of hope, God. I pray that our eyes would be lifted to you. And instead of focusing on the way that the world is so broken, God, I pray that you would lift our eyes and remind us that you are in the process of making it right again. God, I pray that we, you would fill our hearts with conviction about the injustice that we see. So much so, God, that you would remind us what our part is to play and you would push us to do something, Father. God, let us not be people on the sidelines waiting for you to act. God, I pray that you would use us. Help us to jump into what you're, who, what you're already doing in your kingdom so we can participate. And in doing so, Lord, experience the joy of knowing how you work and how you love. God, I pray that you would help us to take away the biases that exist in our hearts that keep us from people. God, break down the walls that keep us from the feelings of insecurity, the things that keep us afraid, Lord. I pray that you would just break them down. God, give us this abandon when it comes to caring for people. And Lord, in our pursuit of holiness, may we be people of justice just as much. We thank you, Father, for what you've done for us. We thank you for this new kingdom. And we pray, God, that your kingdom would come soon. In your precious name, amen.